Sally just bought a brand new Android phone. The wallpaper, her favorite thing in the world, cats. She chats with friends over WhatsApp, shares photos, and plays mobile games, just like millions of people do every day. But today, she receives a message saying, Hey, I made this cute game. It's super fun. Check it out. Sally taps the link. The app downloads. She installs it, thinking it's just another game. What she doesn't see is the hidden connection her phone just made. A remote access tool, silently giving control of her device to someone she'll never meet. Her photos, her messages, her camera, all exposed. In this video, we will step into the shoes of that ethical hacker. Our ethical attacker is Kim. He's running Kaylee Linux, the go-to operating system for penetration testing. His first step is to craft a malicious Android APK, a package that looks like a regular app, but secretly opens a reverse shell back to the attacker's machine. To do that, he uses a powerful tool built into Metasploit. This tool is called MSF Venom. So, what exactly is MSF Venom? It's a command line tool that comes with Metasploit and is used to create something called a payload. A payload is a small piece of code designed to do something specific once it reaches the target. In this case, the payload is a reverse shell. It gives the attacker remote control of the victim's device. You can think of MSF Venom like a recipe builder. You tell it what you want the app to do, where it should connect, and what system it's targeting and it gives you a ready-to-use malicious app. For this attack, Kim uses it to build a reverse shell APK for Android, a fake app that secretly connects back to him once opened. So, as already mentioned, MSF Venom comes bundled with the Metasploit framework. Kim first checks if Metasploit is installed on his Kaylee system. He opens the terminal and types MSF console minus minus version. And there it is, Metasploit is installed. It actually comes pre-installed with Kaylee Linux, which is one of the reasons Kaylee is so popular among penetration testers and ethical hackers. If Metasploit wasn't installed, he could install it by running sudo apt install Metasploit framework. Since Metasploit is available, MSF Venom should be too. But Kim confirms it just in case. In the terminal, he types MSF Venom. And there it is. The tool is available and ready to use. If we scroll up, we can see a usage guide with an example. Let's take a quick look. We can see that MSF Venom uses the lowercase p flag to specify the payload, then L host to set the attacker's IP address, the lowercase f flag to choose the output format, like XE for a Windows program, and finally, the lowercase o flag if you want to set the name and location of the generated file. To craft the malicious app, Kim will use an Android Meter Preta reverse TCP payload. Kim checks whether it's available in the list of MSF Venom supported payloads. To view all available payloads, he runs MSF Venom minus L for list, then payloads. This command outputs a long list of platforms and payload types, everything from Windows and Linux to Mac OS and Android. Scrolling through the list, Kim confirms that the Android Meter Printer Reverse TCP payload is indeed available. This will be the heart of the attack, the code that connects the victim's phone back to Kim's system. Now that Kim has verified the payload he wants to use is available in MSF in him, he is ready to craft the malicious APK file. The command he runs is MSF Venom P, followed by the payloads, here a reverse shell for Android over TCP. Then, L host followed by the IP address of a machine he controls. In this case, is its attacker machine IP address. This is where the victim system will connect back. Then, L port followed by a port number on Kim's machine that will listen for the incoming connection. Here, 4444 is used, which is the default listening port for many Metasploit reverse shell payloads. And finally, dash O to defines the output file, the name of the APK file Kim is creating. In this case, he names it game.apk to make it look like a harmless mobile game. Kim hits enter, and within seconds, the malicious APK is ready. MSF Venom confirms that the payload has been successfully generated. It's 10,232 bytes in size, and it's been saved as game.apk. 
The file is stored in the current working directory. In this case, that's the desktop folder. At first glance, it looks like an innocent Android game. Just another APK waiting to be installed, but this file is anything but harmless. Once it's opened on a victim's phone, it will silently establish a connection back to Kim, giving him full access to the device. Now that Kim has the malicious file, he can send it to Sally. But first, he needs to set up a listener, like a walkie-talkie waiting for the victim response. This listener will be ready and waiting for the reverse shell to connect back the moment Sally clicks on the file. Kim uses the Metasploit framework for this. He opens a new terminal and types MSF console. This launches the Metasploit main interface, where it can configure the listener to wait for the connection from Sally's Android device. Setting up the multi-handler listener is done in three steps. First, Kim tells Metasploit that he wants to use that listener module. To do this, he types use exploit slash multi slash handler. This module acts like a generic listener, ready to handle incoming connections from payloads we have generated. Next, Kim tells that listener what kind of payload it should expect by typing set payload android slash meterpreter slash reverse TCP. In other words, he is saying, hey listener, get ready for a reverse TCP meterpreter connection from an android device. Each payload has its own set of arguments, also called options or variables, that need to be configured. For example, the attacker's IP address and the listening port. To see exactly which ones are required for the selected payload, Kim types, show options. This displays a table of all configurable arguments for the chosen payload, along with whether they are required and their current values. As we can see here, all required arguments are already set, expect L host. L host is the local host, the IP address the victim's Android device will connect back to. In this case, it's Kim's own IP address, or the IP of a machine he controls that's running the listener. Let's go ahead and set it. In Metasploit, setting a payload argument is done by typing set, followed by the argument name, and then the value we want to assign. If we run show options again, we can see that all variables, including L host, are now ready. With everything in place, Kim launches the listener with the command, run. The port is now open, and Metasploit sits quietly, waiting for the victim to take the bait. With the malicious APK file ready and the listener standing by, Kim now needs a way to deliver the payload to the target. In real-world attacks, this is often done through social engineering, tricking the victim into installing the app by making it look useful, fun, or urgent. In our case, Kim will pose as a friendly developer, sharing a link to a simple mobile game he just made for fun. But to share that link, Kim needs to host the APK file somewhere the victim's phone can reach it. For this, he will use a simple tool that's already built into Python, a lightweight web server that can share files over the local network. To do this, Kim opens his terminal and makes sure he is in the folder where the APK file is stored. In this case, that's the desktop. Then he types the Python command to launch a simple web server that will host the malicious APK. The command is python tree -m -http .server 8080 And just like that, the file is now accessible from any device on the same network. In fact, any file inside that shared folder is now public to anyone who has the link. Kim now opens WhatsApp and typed the link he plans to send to Sally. HTTP followed by the IP address of his Kali machine, the one running the web server. Then, 8080, the port the web server is listening on. And finally, the name of the file. Remember, when you launch a Python web server inside a folder, any file in that folder is public to anyone who has the link. This link is long, technical, and looks suspicious. Anyone with a basic sense of caution might hesitate before clicking. So instead, Kim uses a URL shortener, a common trick in phishing and social engineering attacks. With a quick Google search, he finds a free URL shortening service. He pastes the original link, click shorten URL, and instantly gets a short clean version, one that looks far more innocent. Our ethical hacker Kim can now copy that innocent link version, go back to WhatsApp, and crafts the final message. The message reads, 
Hey, I just made a little game. It's so funny. Try it and tell me what you think. He then pastes the innocent shortened URL and hits send. And instantly, the message arrived to Sally. To her, it looks like a casual, friendly message from an online gaming friend she's chatted with before. Just another fun little app to try out. But in reality, it is a Trojan horse, a seemingly harmless app that secretly gives the attacker full control of the device. No flashy warnings. No obvious signs. Just a quiet backdoor, hidden inside a fake game. Let's see what happens when Sally clicks the link. Her browser opens and the APK file downloads. When she opens the downloaded APK file, Android displays a warning, showing the permissions this app is requesting. It can read system logs, access the camera, modify contacts, track location, record audio, read text messages, and many more. But like many users, Sally doesn't pay much attention. Most apps ask for similar permissions, even legitimate ones like maps, social media, or messaging tools. She taps next, then install. The installation proceeds and within seconds it's done. Excited to try the game, Sally launches the app. And that is the moment it happens. Back on Kim's machine, the meter preter session activates. The connection is established. The door is open. Kim now has full remote access to Sally's device, quietly, invisibly, and without her ever knowing. He can now explore the system, starting with basic information like sys info. This command reveals details about the device, the operating system, architecture, and even the language. Next, he tries to access the device's camera. But here, Meter Preta reports, no webcams were found. He also attempts to read Sally's text messages, but again, no messages are found. Why? Because this is a virtual machine, a desktop-based Android system running inside a controlled penetration testing lab environment. It doesn't have real hardware, no webcam, no SIM card, no real SMS history. But on a real phone, these commands would return everything. Camera access, photo access, text messages, contacts, even live GPS location. The potential impact in a real-world attack is far more serious. That's why it's so important to understand how these attacks work. Now let's wrap up by looking at how you can protect yourself. Attacks like the one we just simulated are real, and they happen more often than you think. But the good news is, with a few simple precautions you can stay safe. Never install APK files from unknown sources. If someone sends you an app outside the official Google Play Store, think twice. Most malicious apps are disguised as games, tools, or updates, and are shared through links, QR codes, or sketchy websites. Keep your Android system updated. Security patches are released for a reason. Make sure your device is running the latest Android version available to you. Avoid clicking suspicious links or QR codes. Links and QR codes are one of the most common delivery methods for mobile malware. Hackers often disguise malicious links using URL shorteners or send them through messaging apps like WhatsApp, Telegram, or SMS, making them look like friendly invitations or app recommendations. Pay attention to app permissions. Always review the permissions an app is asking for. If a simple flashlight app wants access to your microphone or SMS, something's wrong. And finally, Avoid plugging your phone or laptop into unknown devices, especially in public places like airports, cafes, or charging stations. A simple-looking USB charger could actually be a data transfer point, capable of stealing files, installing malware, or opening a back door without you ever noticing. And that is it for today. If you found this video eye-opening, give it a like, share it, and subscribe for more in-depth cybersecurity content. Bye-bye.